Thanks so much for the introduction. This is a topic very near and dear to all of our hearts, so let's go ahead and get started. To ensure we all have the same baseline, we're going to start at the beginning. And to understand a protein is to understand its structure and the terminology that's associated with it. Now, we can think of each of these as a building block for the next. So the primary structure of a protein is a chain of amino acids, but the hydrogen bonds of those amino acids create various folding patterns, which refer to the secondary structure. Now, from the 2D folding patterns of the backbone, there are also 3D folding patterns with the side chains, which make up the tertiary structure. And then finally, my favorite difficult word to say, there's the quaternary structure, which is protein to protein interactions. Now, there are about 20 amino acids, depending on who you ask, that can make up a protein backbone. They come in different shapes, different sizes, polarities, acidities, hydrophobicities, you name it. And there are a few different ways that you can refer to a single amino acid. There is the full name in black here. There is the three letter abbreviation in this italicized underneath. And then there is a single letter distinction, which is most commonly used when talking about protein sequence. As you can imagine, there are hundreds of amino acids stacked next to each other sometimes. So to keep it as short and sweet, we use the single letter to talk about primary sequence. But some amino acids are more privy to a plethora of modifications or isomerizations than others are. Now, I won't go through this line by line, um, but please do feel free to use it as a reference and take a glimpse and see what some of the common modifications are in this very abbreviated list. Now, though abbreviated, it is still relevant because the, throughout the next 40 or so minutes, we're going to discuss different methods that can be implemented to identify which of these modifications you are seeing and where. Before we get into the good stuff, let's spend some more time on the possible structures of a protein. Now, again, this is a, a very abbreviated list, but some of the relevant protein types that we're going to cover today. So a monoclonal antibody, or commonly referred to as a MAB, gets its name from its single or mono epitope binding site, where a bispecific antibody has two epitope binding sites on the same antigen. An antibody drug conjugate, or ADC, is kind of a Trojan horse for cancer treatments. It's a biologically active payload or drug that is linked to an antibody. You can see them here highlighted in red. Then lastly, a fusion protein is made up of parts from different gene codes. A deeper dive into the anatomy of an antibody, and here we'll use a monoclonal antibody as the example, each MAB is made up of two heavy chains and two light chains, which are held together by disulfide bonds. And of course, these colors coordinate to the picture. Now, if the antibody were a holiday tree, then the glycans would be an ornament. So these carbohydrates are covalently linked to the antibody and can have a tremendous effect on immunogenicity, half-life, or even protein structure. Now, some additional terminology includes the FC and FAB regions. The FC region binds to cell receptors and facilitates recognition in the body, while the FAB region includes the antigen binding site highlighted here. By this point, we've covered a fair bit about the actual protein itself, but we haven't discussed the process of making the protein. And it's important that we do because the byproducts or impurities of this process can affect patient safety and drug efficacy. So some impurities introduced by the process itself include host cell proteins or viruses. And then the purification of the protein can also lead to excess salts, enzymes, solvents. And consequently, the product itself can also introduce impurities like the fragments that you see here or aggregates and even the glycosylations that I mentioned previously. Higher order structure refers to the multi-dimensional structure of a protein, and this, like many of the modifications I mentioned earlier, can be referenced as product or critical quality attributes, PQAs or CQAs respectively. And they are identified as features that are critical to the quality of the product, as you might expect. Now, higher order structure is a quality attribute because it governs structure and function. So there are implications for safety and efficacy, 
Additionally, alterations to the higher order structure can increase aggregation or immune response, decrease stability or biological function. At this point, we're going to transition into some of the workflows that you can implement to characterize the various attributes of proteins, and we'll focus on these workflows here. And we're going to start with primary structure or the amino acid sequence, moving to post-translational modifications or PTMs. This is the modifications that can occur after translation or creation of the protein, followed by process and product related impurities and fragments, and we'll close out with a secondary structure analysis. Now, throughout the various workflows, we're going to focus on three tools that can be utilized to help you come to a conclusion for your problem. Those tools are accurate mass mass spectrometry coupled to an LC or a liquid chromatography. So we'll, for, we'll refer to it as LCMS, followed by capillary electrophoresis and microflu microfluidic modulation spectroscopy. As we dive into primary structure confirmation, we'll use three-ish different workflows and each of which is depicted in the illustrations down at the bottom. First, we'll separate the intact protein. We can also reduce the intact molecule into different subunits, or we can digest the intact protein with a proteolytic enzyme, which will cleave the protein at specific amino acids, creating smaller, more manageable fragments. The NISMAP is a popular standard or conduit for method development because it's very well characterized. Now, this may or may not look like a bit much to you here, but above each chromatogram, you can see the primary sequence of the heavy and light chains. Now here we're using a tunable electron voltage to fragment the intact protein. And there's significant amount of coverage across the region highlighted here. Now, as a large intact protein, you can imagine it's more challenging to fragment 150 kilodaltons with just mass spec fragmentation. So it's standard to see a bit less than 100% sequence coverage. Even so, this step allows us to confirm the intact mass and even observe lar large modifications like glycosylation or methylation. Now, a great tool to implement is sample preparation as a pre-analytical separation to break apart the subunits before we do the detection. Now we can observe about an 85% sequence coverage for the light chain here. And this is a big feat for the tunable electron voltage as a fragmentation tool, because the literature states about an average of 65% sequence coverage when using existing techniques. And this is even including summing ions and using multiple runs as a summation. So here with just one injection, we can get a very high coverage in a highly reproducible and quantitative way. Now, when you use sample prep to digest the protein into smaller peptides, you can really get into the nitty gritty. So nitty that we can actually differentiate between ASP and ISO-ASP isomers. And differentiating these isomers is important because it can help as, or it can happen as a degradation pathway. And by looking at the C, Z ions that are produced, or C or Z ions that are produced with electron fragmentation, rather than the B or Y ions that are produced with CID, these are distinct diagnostic ions, the C plus 57 or Z minus 57, that can differentiate between the two, identifying iso-asp right here on this top chromatogram and asp in this second peak down here. Very cool feature about this electron activated dissociation is the differentiation of enantiomers. So not only can we see the, or not only can we differentiate between ASP and ISOASP, but we can see the L and D forms of ISOASP. And of course, this is made easy to do if you have the right software. Similarly to ASP and ISOASP, the isomerization between isoleucine and leucine is considered a post-translational modification or PTM because it can affect the secondary structure of the protein, which we now know can mean an impact on safety and efficacy amongst many other things. Now, typically there's no way to differentiate between the two. They have just about the same retention time. But when using C or Z ions that we get with electron activated dissociation, the Z minus 43 or Z minus 29 can clearly differentiate and confirm the proper sequence of the protein. Last for primary sequence confirmation is sequence C 
sequence variant analysis, or SVA. Here, a peptide in very low abundance was identified because of a mass shift. So you can see here from 1767 down to 1623. Now, what should be in the fifth position is F or phenylalanine. With CID, it's difficult to determine whether leucine or isoleucine is in its place. But as we've seen just previously, with the Z minus 43 or Z minus 23 peaks, we can confirm, in fact, that it is leucine in place of phenylalanine. Now we can all take a quick breath and move right on to post-translational modifications. And this is where things are going to get really jazzy because we're not just talking about mass spec anymore. We'll start though by using LCMS to revisit the popular peptide mapping and subunit analysis workflows. And then I'll hand it off to my colleague and we'll use capillary isoelectric focusing and charge variant distribution. Typical electron fragmentation methods don't work well with singly charged peptide species or singly charged species at all. But because electron activated dissociation is tunable, we can identify the sulfation on the multi specific MAB digest. Multi specific meaning it is an antibody with more than one epitope binding site and it has been digested with an enzyme and then compared to synthetic versions that do and don't include or contain this same sulfation. So even though it's a singly charged peptide, we can identify and localize the solvation on the peptide. So determining exactly where it lives on the peptide. Switching to a different modality, an antibody drug conjugate or ADC, here is a depiction of what an ADC would look like. So we have the MAB here, followed by the linker or the drug linker, as well as the cytotoxic payload. Now by using EAD or electron activated dissociation, we can tune the energy to leave the linker and even part of the drug attached to the peptide fragment. Now this allows for very confident assignment of the lysine linked drug location. Now, if you look closely here, you can see there are two Ks and K indicates a lysine and we know that it is a lysine linked antibody. So we have to determine exactly which of those lysines is occupied by the payload. And by using EAD, we can do exactly that. Moving again to another new modality. This is a fusion protein that is highly glycosylated. Now, because of the softer tunable fragmentation of EAD, we can keep the glycan intact on the amino acid base to allow for localization of the glycan as well as identification of the glycan. Now, previously this glycan would have been lost in chromatography because of its single charge, but because of EAD, we have clarity and confirmation here. It's worth mentioning, since I haven't previously, aside from the list of modifications at the start, that there are two forms of glycosylation. There are N-linked glycans, which are linked to the nitrogen of asparagine, and there are O-linked glycans, which are linked to, an oxy to the oxygen of serine or threonine. Now, if we take a look at the glycans on the subunit fragments, so moving from the peptide digest, the digested peptide to subunit fragments, the software depicts this nice heat map to help us identify two N-linked glycans on different subunits, as well as 13 O-linked glycans in this hinge region of the protein. Now, this hinge region is basically where the heavy chain bends to accommodate for the light chain. So you can see in a pretty small region, there is a very high density of O-linked glycans. Here's a look at those N-linked glycans and some of the O-linked glycans, which occur on the fragment before the hinge region, in this instance known as the TNFR subunit. Now these axes are a little bit on different scales, but you can see our main peak here, that's the subunit, the TNFR 187 here and here as well as some of those different glycans. You can see each of the various species identified in all of these chromatograms. Finally, to wrap it up for LCMS, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention multi-attribute methodology or MAM. 
which is a popular technique for monitoring those critical or product quality attributes. It requires a highly reproducible and robust method to be able to leverage the same data for in-depth characterization, as well as relative quantitation of those quality attributes. So it's almost difficult to tell, but this is actually a, an overlay of five replicates of a MAB digest. So these are all various proteins and you can kind of see the various colors peeking through. But as I mentioned, EAD is a highly reproducible and very robust technique for fragmenting your proteins. Now, I will leave you with my colleague, Stephen Calciano, to discuss additional tools that can be leveraged to track post-translational modifications amongst other important attributes. Thank you, Paula. Those were some great examples of how LCMS technology can be used to localize post-translational modifications and provide insights into potential molecular product quality attributes to track throughout the development process. Another way to track post-translational modifications is to assess the protein from a global or zoomed out perspective. Instead of tracking specific quality attributes, we can take our understanding of major chemical degradation pathways, for example, sialylation, deamidation, C-terminal lysine cleavage, or any of the other known degradation pathways, and understand their effect at a molecular level, as well as the impact on the type of product impurity that could be introduced to the process. These protein degradation pathways leave a signature throughout the formation of either acidic or basic species, resulting in a more complex, heterogeneous mixture in our target product. In the next few slides, we'll overview a workflow that can be used to separate these heterogeneous mixtures based on slight differences in charge due to the formation of acidic or basic species in our target product. Capillary isoelectric focusing is an electrophoretic separation technique that allows us to exploit minor differences in charge characteristics among closely related protein species, or proteoforms, to determine the heterogeneity in our sample. There are three steps to this workflow. Loading the sample, focusing the sample to increase the resolution between species, and mobilization of the sample toward the detector. The key here is that each protein species will have a distinct isoelectric point, which is the pH at which the net charge of the protein is zero. Shown on the right is a diagram of an example protein which has a pi of 6.8. So when placed in a solution at pH 6.8, the net charge will be zero. If placed in a solution of pH below 6.8, the protein will be positively charged. And when placed in a solution above pH 6.8, the net charge will be negative. The mobilization time of various proteins in the mixture correlates with the calibration plot of PI, or isoelectric point, versus mobilization time, enabling us to determine the PI of the protein species in our sample. Now that we know the basics of capillary isoelectric focusing, let's take a closer look at a diagram of what is physically happening inside of our capillary during the separation of our protein sample. At the left side of the diagram, we have our low pH analyte, an electrode, the anode. Over toward the right side of the diagram, we have our high pH catholyte, an electrode, the cathode. Additionally, we add our PI markers, which are synthetic peptides with a known PI as well as our sample. Once an electric field is applied, the proteins, PI markers, and amphalites become a sorted gradient in the capillary from low to high PI. Capillary isoelectric focusing is a reliable method and provides in-depth sample information, including identity of the main peak through assignment of PI, as well as consistent characterization of the percent of impurities both acidic and basic, throughout the sample. These data show three replicate analyses of a commercial monoclonal antibody, trastuzumab, with an identity confirmation by the assigned main peak PI of 8.71, as well as consistent injection-to-injection -injection assignment of 33.5% acidic variance, as well as 6% basic variance, all with RSDs below 1.1%. This charge variant analysis workflow by capillary isoelectric focusing is particularly useful for force degradation studies to better predict the stability of candidate molecules as they progress throughout development.
In this example, we show capillary isoelectric focusing analysis of trastuzumab under stressed conditions of pH 8 and 40 degrees Celsius held for one day and five days, as compared to a control or non-stress sample. As you can see, there is a dramatic change in the profile of trastuzumab under severe stressing conditions. But how do other molecules compare? Here's a detailed view of the CIEF traces before and after forced degradation treatment of thanistamab in panel A, rituximab in panel B, infliximab in panel C, and the adotrastuzumab in in panel D. Samples were stressed at 40 degrees Celsius in pHH storage buffer for both one day, which is trace B, and five days, which is trace C. Trace A represents the unstressed sample in all panels. These data demonstrate how CIEF can be applied as a platform method for a wide variety of therapeutic protein species and can help you make informed decisions about your product during developability assessments. While charge heterogeneity analysis is an important part of protein characterization, it's certainly not the only quality attribute that's routinely assessed during therapeutic protein development. Protein fragments and impurities are regularly monitored throughout the product and process development cycle as a part of any product's analytical control strategy. Antibody fragments have significantly reduced activity compared to the full product and can cause immunogenicity or impact the pharmacokinetic profile in vivo. Additionally, cell culture additives can be present in low amounts in the final drug product if the purification process is not optimized. In this section, we'll overview a high-resolution protein sizing and quantification workflow that enables determination and quantitation of product-related impurities, including protein fragments and size variants. We can also analyze process-related impurities which are present in low abundance. The key workflow we will review is capillary gel electrophoresis using SDS. Prior to laboratories adopting capillary electrophoresis SDS applications, the majority of protein sizing and purity information was revealed through SDS page slab gels. The purpose of these slab gels was to show protein purity and heterogeneity by separating proteins based on their size with electrophoresis. This process, however, was labor intensive and struggled with poor reproducibility and resolution. The CESDS application is a replacement for slab gel analysis. This approach is now the industry standard for quantitation of impurities in monoclonal antibodies, for example. Here we compare an IgG sample run on both a slab gel and on capillary electrophoresis. As you can see, the capillary electrophoresis approach reveals higher resolution and quantitative information achievable in an automated fashion within 20 minutes per sample. Capillary gel electrophoresis is the adaptation of traditional slab gel electrophoresis in a capillary using linear polymers in a solution to create a molecular sieve. This allows analytes that have a similar charge to size ratio to be resolved by hydrodynamic size. In this application, it allows for a typical molecular sieving range of 10 to 225 kilodaltons. The separation is based on the analyte's differential migration through the gel matrix and is solely based on the hydrodynamic size differences. However, to characterize by molecular mass, the same charge on all proteins is required. This is achieved through an anionic detergent, sodium dodecyl sulfate, which complexes with proteins at a constant ratio of 1 to 1.4. In addition, reducing reagents like beta mercaptoethanol can be introduced to the sample to reduce disulfide bonds and further denature the protein. Upon the application of voltage, the proteins migrate through the gel matrix with the smaller proteins migrating quickest and the larger proteins migrating more slowly. As previously mentioned, the protein separation is achieved by capillary electrophoresis and molecular sieving. The capillary is filled with an entangled polymer solution that is replaced for each sample, which improves reproducibility and prevents sample carryover. We then introduce our SDS treated protein sample and apply voltage. Once the voltage is applied, proteins migrate through the gel matrix with the proteins migrating in order of increasing size in the direction of the anode. 
Reverse polarity, negative to positive, is utilized along with UV, PDA, or laser-induced fluorescence detection, depending on the specific workflow. So you might ask, what results should you expect when analyzing a sample like an IgG-based protein therapeutic using the CESDS workflow? Validated protocols are published and reagents are available to separate both reduced and non-reduced monoclonal antibodies. When prepared under reducing conditions, the resulting data will show a heavy chain, light chain, non-glycosylated heavy chain, and any lower molecular weight impurities that fall between the heavy and light chains. When prepared under non-reducing conditions, you can expect to see an IgG dimer, intact IgG glycosylated and non-glycosylated peaks, two heavy and one light chain products, two heavy chain products, one heavy and one light chain product, one heavy chain, and lastly, one light chain product. Here's an example of eight replicates analyzed simultaneously with the CESDS impurity workflow performed on a multi-capillary SIEX instrument. As we discussed, this methodology is used to determine impurities within therapeutic antibodies. This assay is the industry's gold standard for monoclonal antibody characterization and QC lot release. This trace shows a typical IgG prepared under reducing conditions and shows from left to right the 10 KD marker, light chain, nine glycosylated heavy chain, and heavy chain peaks. These data show good reproducibility between multiple samples for the light and heavy chain of IgG using UV detection. Now let's take a look at an example of a non-reduced preparation of the very same sample, NISTMAB. Here we show the large IgG monomeric peak and associated impurities. This method calculates monomeric IgG purity at 94.45%, and we have labeled the light chain, glycosylated heavy chain, heavy chain light chain product, two heavy chain product, two heavy one light chain product, and the IgG dimer in the zoomed view. This analysis can be completed in less than 18 minutes with high resolution. The CESDS workflow is compatible with both UV and laser-induced fluorescence detection modes. Here we're looking at delinearity for UV and lift detection. For the UV analysis, which is shown on top, the LOD and LOQ for NIST monoclonal antibody was determined to be 2.4 and 4.9 micrograms per ml, respectively, with three to four orders of dynamic range. Here, we use the parallel processing capability of our multi-capillary instrument to run eight concentration points in parallel within a single injection. Shown on the bottom panel is the quantitation result from laser-induced fluorescence detection. In this case, the NIST monoclonal antibody was first labeled by a fluorescence dye and then analyzed on the multi-capillary CE system. We saw an excellent linear dynamic range of four orders, and the LOD and LOQ obtained here are four nanogram per ml and 10 nanogram per ml respectively. In addition to its capability to determine protein size and concentration, the CESDS molecular weight workflow can be employed to detect impurities in your sample. Shown in this figure is an overlap of the electropherograms where lysozyme is spiked at different levels into a 1,000 microgram per ml IgG sample. We can see a 10%, 1%, and 0.1% lysozyme peak. This high sensitivity aspect of CE serves to illustrate the workflow's impurity detection capabilities. The CESDS workflow can be effectively used to analyze therapeutic proteins and their associated product and process related impurities with high resolution and sensitivity. Now I'd like to pass the presentation over to Dave Sloan from our partners at Redshift Bio to discuss some recent innovations in biophysical characterization of biopharmaceuticals. Thank you, Stephen. Hello, everybody. I will now focus on higher order structure characterization of proteins. Protein structure, specifically higher order structure, is critical to a protein's function and biological activity. Additionally, the structure is critically linked to its stability, immunogenicity, and potential to aggregate, all critical parameters when developing biologic drugs. 
I will be focusing on structural characterization utilizing microfluidic modulation spectroscopy, a technology developed by Redshift Bio and commercialized in the AQS3 Pro and Apollo systems. When thinking about protein structure, there are multiple levels of protein structure to be considered and many tools used to characterize these different levels of protein structure, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. This section of the talk will be focused on protein secondary structure and the characterization of that secondary structure. Secondary structure is the alpha helices, beta sheets, turns, and unordered regions which comprise a protein. Secondary structure has been traditionally characterized to be a circular dichroism, or CD, or FTIR, which is called Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy. I will not be focused on these traditional techniques, but I'll be detailing the technology in a few application examples utilizing MMS, or Microfluidic Modulation Spectroscopy, which adds automation, a wide dynamic range, as well as the ability to measure biotherapeutics in complex formulation buffers with the often required excipients to give the therapeutics their stability and biological activity. How does MMS probe secondary structure? MMS uses infrared light to probe the vibrational modes of the protein carbonyl backbone. We are measuring the IR spectrum in the amide one band or the protein fingerprint region, which is from approximately 1600 to 1700 wave numbers. Within this region, the absorbent spectra is sensitive to changes in the environment of the hydrogen bonds and these changes allow MMS to identify the higher order structure or the percentages of alpha helices, beta sheets, as well as turns and disordered regions of the proteins being studied. All of this can be accomplished from protein concentrations as low as 0.1 mg per mil all the way up to 200 mg per mil. And this can be done in formulation buffers. This wide dynamic range and compatibility with formulation buffer does differentiate MMS from the other secondary structure techniques available on the market. On the left are some examples of the specifications of the Apollo system. Instead of dwelling on the specs, I'll focus on the benefits that these specifications provide to researchers. MMS is a structural, MMS is a laser-based technique and the quantum cascade laser gives us the ability to measure very small structural changes, which can be the earliest indications of aggregation or other structural perturbations. Additionally, the QCL is what allows us to go down to 0.1 mg per mil concentrations of proteins in aqueous buffer. The amide one region is what allows us to measure the protein's secondary structural elements. In the next slide, I'll go deeper into the referencing or background subtraction which is what allows MMS to measure protein structure within a wide range of buffers, salts, detergents, amino acids, as well as other common and uncommon excipients. Microfluidic modulation spectroscopy uses a flow cell, which autom automatically modulates back and forth between sample and buffer. I will animate the slide. This rapid modulation between sample and buffer is what allows MMS to generate high quality spectral data without interference from water, buffers, or excipients. This system takes a spectra of the protein in its buffer and then immediately takes a reference spectra of the buffer alone and then generates the differential absorbance spectra, which is what's used for downstream analysis. The Apollo automatically takes multiple spectra and averages them to generate ultra high resolution data which facilitates the analysis of low concentration proteins and the me measurement of very small structural changes. It's also worth measuring that the MMS is a non-destructive technique and the sample can be recovered and reused on other analysis tools. I will now share a few examples of MMS in action. In this example, MMS is being compared to SEC or size exclusion chromatography. SEC is a classical tool for measuring the size of a protein 
and changes in and changes in size allow one to detect the presence of larger protein aggregates. This is an ADC or antibody drug conjugate study, and it is a pH stress study. In this study, the ADC was stored at pH 2 for three days, and the size and protein structure are compared to the non-stressed ADC sample. On the right, you see the SEC data, and we can clearly see the presence of low and high molecular weight peaks. The low molecular weight species is the ADC by itself, and the higher molecular weight peak is the aggregated ADC. SEC clearly detects the presence of an aggregate, but it does not allow us to understand if this is a structural or colloidal aggregate. On the left is the MMS spectra. We see the characteristic spectra for an ADC in the unstressed sample. And then we see a dramatic change in the spectra for the stressed sample. MMS is clearly showing us that there's a dramatic structural change occurring in the ADC due to the stress. The SEC data also detected the presence of the aggregated species, and when combined with the MMS data, we know that there is an aggregation and that it is a structural aggregate. Additionally, in the middle of the plot, we see the HOS, or higher order structural information, and there's clearly a major shift in the beta sheets from the native or intramolecular beta sheet to the non-native or intermolecular beta sheets, which are a hallmark of an aggregated protein species. Taken together, the SEC and MMS results give us a very clear picture of the aggregation which is occurring due to the pH stress. This is another ADC study, pH, ADC pH stress study, and it involves two different ADCs. ADC1 is on the left, and it is sensitive to, the, sensitive to the pH stress. You can again see there's a shift from the native intramolecular beta sheets to the non-native intermolecular beta sheets due to the pH stress. On the contrary, ADC2 is very acid stable, and there's essentially no change in the higher order structure due to the pH stress. MMS is able to predict which ADC might be able to withstand an acidic um, formulation buffer. It is also possible that ADC1 is a poor drug candidate as it may not, ha may not have the stability required to make it through the drug development process. This is a thermal stress ADC example. On the left is an ADC which is stressed at 50 C for 10 days. And on the right is the same ADC stressed at 70 C for 20 minutes. In the bottom half of both panels, you can see that SEC is showing the presence of higher molecular weight aggregates, both in the 50 C condition and the 70 C stress. But the high molecular weight aggregates are present at a much higher percentage in the 70 degree C condition. In the two upper panels is the MMS HOS data. In the 50 C condition on the left, there are no apparent structural changes and no apparent formation of intermolecular beta sheets. On the right, there is a large structural change and we very clearly see the presence of intermolecular beta sheets indicating structural aggregation. By combining the SEC and the MMS data together, we see that there is most likely colloidal aggregation, but not structural aggregation in the 50C stress condition. In the 70C stress condition, we see clear structural change and the formation of intermolecular beta sheets from the MMS data. Adding the SEC data showing the size change lets us conclude that this is indeed structural aggregation. This is a study. This study is an analysis of the NISTMAB. It's a concentration study, and it shows that NISTMAB does not undergo any concentration-dependent conformational changes. We are analyzing NISTMAB from 2 mg up to 70 mg per ml. The spectra are superimposable across the whole range. We, do, we also calculate concentration as part of the analysis, and you can see the great linear, range, linear concentration curve we generate on the right-hand side of this plot. This is the HOS plot for the NISTMAB. As we could see from the previous slide, the spectra were superimpose, superimposable, and the HOS percentages are the same for all concentrations tested, and the percentages of, percentages of helices, turns, sheets, and unordered regions are what you would expect for the NISTMAB. My last example is looking at trazduzumab alone or conjugated to three different drugs using two different conjugation chemistries. 
you can see that trazduzumab conjugated via thiol chemistry to MMAE or GELD still give a spectra which is basically super, superimposable with trazduzumab alone. You can also look at the similarity scores in the lower right, and there's no statistically diff significant different changes in the structure between trazduzumab by itself or conjugated to MMAE or GELD. However, when using a less specific lysine conjugation chemistry, you can see the blue spectra is very different than the other spectra. There is a statistically significant change in structure between trazduzumab conjugated via lysine chemistry to DM as compared to the other three molecules. And looking at the HOS percentages, we can see that there is a significant increase in unordered structure and a decrease in turn structure via the lysine com conjugation chemistry as compared with the unconjugated and cysteine conjugated trasducimab. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dave, and thank you, Paula, for joining me and hosting this event. Also, for more information about how SciX can help you solve your biopharmaceutical analysis questions, please visit the SciX Now Learning Hub by creating an account at training.sciex.com. Thank you all for your attention, and we'd be happy to help answer any questions you may have.